It is a quick brief presentation. It is a lecture on the Charter Act 1793, its circumstances, main provisions and significance. It is part of the lecture series with links to complete usable answers. Now let us talk about the purpose and plan of the lecture. The lecture is on the topic of the Charter Act 1793. It is based on the content of the book, The History of Constitution of India. The Charter Acts during the company rule in India 1773-1858, ISBN 13. 978-1983046834 with an OCLC number slash unique identifier 10861699936. The link to the online purchase of its ebook and paperback copy is given in the video's description. The purpose is to provide a video study aid to the content of the book. The lecture begins now. The topic of the lecture is the circumstances, provisions, and significance of the Charter Act, 1793. Let us first get a glimpse of the Act in the beginning. By the Act of 1767, the British Parliament allowed the company the privilege to retain territorial possession in India. The continuation of the company was decided in the Regulating Act 1773, wherein it was allowed to exist for the next 20 years. The British Parliament maintained the institution of the Board of Control, which directed, superintend, and controlled the workings of the company. From the Charter Act 1793, a series of charters sustained the company till 1858. In 1793, the Parliament granted the charter to the East India Company of London. This was historic because earlier, the East India Trading Company was getting the charter from the royal family, and by 1793, the Parliament had played that role. The ownership, which rested in the court of the director, felt satisfied that the royal privilege was legally secured by the British Parliament. Let us now study the circumstance leading to enactment of the Charter Act 1793. The Charter Act of 1786 may taken as the first influencing factor. The British Parliament was dominated by such political personalities of Britain who were friends of Lord Cornwallis. The loss of American colonies weighed heavily on the minds of Lord Cornwallis and his friends in the British Parliament. Lord Cornwallis was one of the generals who had surrendered to the American revolutionaries. The British politicians were interested in adjusting Cornwallis to a respectable place. Cornwallis demanded a better say in the British Indian administration as per his status, for which the British politicians had made adjustments to the British East India Company. Next, the Declaratory Act of 1788 was also an influencing factor. Henry Dundas was the first president of the Board of Control. Henry Dundas deputed four royal regiments to India and paid the expenses out of the Indian revenue, which the Court of Directors of East India Company objected to. The 1788 Act transferred the full power and supremacy to the Board of Control, which showed the benefit that the British Empire was getting out of India. The Act transferred the power of the company to the Ministry of the Crown. Next, the directors of the company applied for the renewal. The directors of the company sought the renewal of the charters before the tenure of 20 years came to a close by. The power of the company was gradually being withdrawn from it by statutes like the Declaratory Act of 1788. The monopoly of trade with India held enough attraction to maintain the company by the court of directors and the prestige involved in making appointments in India. It was considered a privilege bestowed upon the court of directors by the royal house. Then, there was the support of ministers to the company. Many ministers in the crown had a direct interest in the existence of the company. They had patronized the company. They had a pecuniary and political interest in maintaining the company. Even there were favorable circumstances. When the company's expiry date approached, Britain got involved in a war with France, and the country's attention was entirely diverted to that war. Some merchants petitioned the Parliament to end the monopoly of trade granted to the company. The bill for a new charter was quietly passed in the Parliament because of the factors mentioned above. Now a brief survey of the main provisions of the Charter Act 1793. In the Provision 1, the company's trade monopoly was extended for 20 years. 
the private individuals were allowed to trade to the extent of 3,000 tons of shipping. The provision too, provided, the members of the Board of Control and its staff were to be paid from India's revenues. As per the Provision 3, the Governor Generals and the Governors of the Presidencies were empowered to override the majority in their councils. This power was already given to Governor General Cornwallis in 1788 in the Declaratory Act. The number of members in each council was restricted to three. In the Provision 4, the Governor General in Council was given full power and authority to superintend, direct, and control the presidency governments. When the Governor General visited other presidencies, a provision empowered him to supersede the governor there. As per the Provision 5, the Governor General was empowered to depute one of the members of his council as the Vice President of the council. The Vice President was to act for the Governor General when the latter was on tour to other presidencies. It was as per the Provision 6 that, the Governor General, the Governors, the Commander-in-Chief, and some other officers were not permitted to leave India while they held office. This provision continued even when the company was abolished. It was stipulated in Provision 7 that the Commander-in-Chief was removed from the Council of the Governor-General's membership. He was eligible to become a member of the Court of Directors, which deputed him to the Council. In a Provision 8, it was ordained that the Charter reiterated the policy of non-intervention, no further conquests, and no further extension of the territories in India. It was declared the British nation's wish, honor, and policy. This policy was inaugurated by the Pitts India Act of 1784 and again reiterated in the Charter Act of 1793. In Provision 9, the rules were laid that, the provision ruled that accepting gifts and presents by British subjects holding any office or employment under the Royal Majesty or the Company was unlawful. It was declared an act of extortion and a misdemeanor at law. The rules in Provision 10 were the following. The Civil Service Rule adopted the principles of grading ranks and seniority in service. Promotion to a higher post was made based on the length of service. Only covenant servants of the company were to be given positions with pay over £500 a year. As per the Provision 11, the sale of liquor was made subject to the grant of a license by the Governor-General, who was empowered to levy a sanitary tax in the presidency towns. Now, the specific of Provision 12. The Supreme Court of Calcutta's jurisdiction was extended to the high seas and given admiralty jurisdiction. By the Provision 13, the Governor-General was given the power to appoint the members of civil services as justices of peace. It was in the Provision 14. The company's finances were also regulated. Under a provision of the Act, a particular amount was assumed to be the company's annual surplus. Five lakh pounds were allocated from that assumed fund to pay the company's debts. We are going to explain the criticism and significance of the Charter Act of 1793. Point 1. It started a series of fresh charters after every 20 years. Three more charter acts followed, which continued the company's existence until it was abolished by the Good Government of India Act in 1858. It introduced Parliament's measure to establish control over the workings of the company under the direction and supervision of the state. Parliament passed the Charter Act of 1793 exclusively to give patents to the company. Point 2. Provisions of the 1784 Act reiterated. 
the Charter Act 1793 reiterated the principles and policies defined in Pitt's India Act 1784. The act stipulated that the company would not follow the policy of territorial expansion. However, the Governors General benefited from the distance from London, the underdeveloped mode of communication, which was time-consuming, and the more protracted processes of decision-making on the part of the Board of Control and Court of Directors. Point 3. It strengthened the control of Parliament over the company. The Charter Act 1793 consolidated the provisions of the Regulating Act 1773 and the Pitts India Act 1784. It provided more details about the rules already established by earlier statutes. The powers of the Governor General were defined, and he was made more powerful. Point 4. The exploitation of Indian wealth increased. The Charter Act of 1793 increased the expenditure of the Indian government. The salaries of the Board of Control were derived from India's revenue. The economic condition of India was deteriorating in the territories which had come under the rule of the Governor General. Point 5. The post of Governor General in Council Consolidated. No significant changes were made in the Government of India. However, the Governor General's power was increased. He was empowered to make appointments to the post of Justice of Peace, given the power to levy taxes, and authorized to issue liquor licenses. Point 6. Parliament's dominance over revenue and territory of British India administration. The Act brought finance and accounts under the purview of Parliament. The Charter Act of 1793 was a consolidating measure. Before the Charter Act of 1813, it had brought under its sway a significant part of Indian territory. Now a suggestive exercise. Question. What were the main features of the Charter Act of 1793? The lecture ends. Your comments, suggestions, and remarks will help develop future lectures.